Okay, there's no way around it. I'm just going to have to say it. Ball screw. <gasps> YouTube algorithm. Please note, that's not a swear word. Even though it does sound like it might be. Please don't restrict or demonetize my video. I promise I'll upload more regularly in the future. Really, I will. Anyway, if you clicked on this video, the chances are you already know what a ball screw is. But if not, it's basically a cross between a regular screw and nut and a ball bearing. The balls are in between the nut and the screw. This has a number of advantages, such as less friction and less backlash compared to a regular screw. They are also much more accurate when used for positioning, such as in CNC machines. One drawback to a ball screw is that the nut is much larger and longer than a regular one, which can be a problem in tight spaces. I found myself wanting a ball screw for a very specific application and a regular one, even a very small one, wasn't going to work. So I just had to make one myself. Let's be clear here, I'm not trying to make a super precision zero backlash screw, just something that's more efficient than an ordinary type of screw and can be back driven, which is important in robotic actuators as it allows compliance to transmit excessive loads that might otherwise break something. And most importantly, it needs to fit in the space I have available. Now, I've tried to make ball screws before, with limited success. The screw part is not the problem, though it is more of a challenge to cut than a normal thread. The thread pitch is a lot bigger than you typically screw cut on a lathe. and the profile of the thread means a large area of the cutting tool makes contact, which can lead to tool chatter and a poor surface finish. But with care, a ball screw can be turned on just about any regular screw cutting lathe. The problem is the nut. There are the same challenges of pitch and thread profile, but because these need to be turned internally, to be able to reach a much longer and less rigid tool has to be used. It's very hard to make a good job of this. It's also hard to measure or even see inside the nut. With a ball screw, it's much harder just to screw in the screw to check the fit. So, I thought I'd try a different way of making a nut. For a ball screw. Everything looks normal so far. This is how I'd usually go about making a nut. Next, a tool similar to this would be used to screw cut the threads. But instead, I'm going to take this bar and machine away exactly half of it. This gives me much better access to the inside. Then I can mill the threads on my CNC machine with a small ball-nosed end mill which matches the diameter of the balls I'm going to use. Now it's a half nut. In fact, it's two half nuts next to each other. One is a mirror image of the other, so that when flipped over, they make a whole nut.
This nut is made from brass. I deliberately chose a soft material so that if my machining tolerances aren't perfect and it ends up being too tight, then it can wear itself in. It's not going to have to withstand large forces, so it doesn't need to be hardened steel. The screw is turned from EN8 alloy steel and could be hardened. But if I do harden it, that might cause it to warp. So I'm leaving it as it is. These holes are for dowel pins to align the two halves. And these holes are for bolts to screw the two parts together. Let's take a closer look at how ball screws work. You might think, that a channel needs to be cut in both the screw and the nut that closely matches the radius of the ball. But in fact, this will cause the ball to make contact over its whole surface, which won't allow it to spin properly and will cause friction and wear. What we actually want is for only a small patch of the ball to make contact, and these patches should be equidistant from the centre of the ball in both the screw and the nut. There are several ways to do this. The simplest is just to use smaller balls. This does lead to increased backlash though, which is undesirable for most applications. Though there are ways to deal with this too, such as having a second circuit of balls which is offset from the first to take up the backlash. A better way is to make the channel not exactly match the shape of the ball. Usually a gothic arch is used instead of a simple arc. Now I could have ground a lathe tool to this shape to cut the screw, and I suppose I could even have made a custom D-bit cutter for the milling machine. But what I actually did was just relieve the outer part of the thread with a smaller end mill. People sometimes ask me what fancy CAD software I use to generate simultaneous 3-axis toolpaths like this. Most often I just use Excel to generate the G-code from some simple formulas. Anything that's a geometric shape is quite easy to define using trigonometry and basic maths. I did the same thing to the screw as well using a smaller diameter cutter. This should give a better contact and smoother operation. I made this 3D printed jig to hold the balls in position so I can measure accurately across the diameter and adjust the size of the screw. The nut has only one circuit of balls that do one and a half turns around the screw. The balls need to be able to recirculate, so a pathway needs to be created to join the two ends. This pathway needs to be a gentle curve. I don't want any sharp 90 degree angles that might jam up the balls. So I need to mill a smooth radius. I first drilled holes all the way through the nut at either end of the circuit. Then on my manual milling machine, I aligned the direction of the channel with the x-axis of the mill. And then I used the radius function on the DRO to mill the radius in the x-z plane. Digital readouts usually have lots of useful functions like this that are often overlooked but they allow you to do things on a manual machine that you might assume you need a CNC for. A cover is made with a matching radius to seal the channel.
You might have noticed these covers on commercial ball nuts. Here you can see two circuits. There's a third one not visible on the other side. Time for a test. There's reassuringly little backlash in the axial direction. Less than a tenth of a millimetre. There is quite a lot of rock though, due to there being only one circuit of balls. But the nut will be constrained by its housing and not be able to move in this direction. Before final assembly, I packed the nut full of grease and loaded as many balls as I could fit in. The grease does a good job of holding the balls in place without the screw. I expected there to be some notching or roughness as the balls pass between the two halves of the nut. But actually it feels very smooth with no tight spots. And just to demonstrate that it can be back driven. So I'm actually quite pleased with the result. This method allowed me to make a ball screw that turned out better than I expected. But having done it this way now, would I do it again? Well, yes actually, because I need another one for the other side. But what I mean is, is it worth the time and effort to make your own ball screws? If you absolutely can't buy one that suits your unique application, then maybe yes. But any ball screw I could make isn't going to be as strong, accurate or last as long as the cheapest one you could buy. Well, maybe not THE cheapest. But any half decent one is likely to be better. In any case, it was an interesting engineering experiment.